been quite a change. It was an era of time that he was very successful. Kids that never witnessed that don't want to be missed. It was the Kroger grocery chain, actually. Uh, it was located on Archer Avenue, and uh, I worked there actually from 1954 to 1961. Heaven, I'm in heaven, and my heart beats so that I can hardly speak. And I seem to find the happiness. Their home office was in Cincinnati, Ohio. And this particular business was open six days a week, not on Sunday. And, and actually uh, from 9 until 6 in the evening and 9 until 9 in the evening on Saturday. And it was actually a full line grocery chain store. I think they really specialized, as far as you're concerned, on the meat line, the meat, the meat products. And they were actually cut here, and uh, if a customer wanted something different, they actually would do it for them. Uh, the produce was uh, fresh each day. Each day, there was a truck that came each and every day that, during the middle of the night, that uh, provided fresh milk, bread, and produce at that point in time. So it was something fresh each and every day. Primarily, I would say approximately 60% of the people in Marshall did do some trading at the at the Kroger store. The Kroger Company actually closed its store in November of 1961. And at that particular point in time, it then became red and white, owned by uh, the beer house chain out of Vincennes, Indiana. And it, it actually evolved from this particular location to a location on Locust Street. And then it was, again, managed by Dwayne Huey. He actually was the proprietor and, and the leasee of that particular, it was a leasee type arrangement. The business actually closed because the volume was not high enough, number one. Number two, the Terre Haute area began to pick up and had more and more Kroger stores plus uh, other stores in that location and they could go again 24-7. We weren't set up for that, didn't have the parking, uh, didn't have the space, uh, had the capability, but just the physical uh, nature of the complex just wasn't appropriate for that type of environment. Well, basically, I think that it was it became it was a business to start with, and as it evolved, it became kind of like a, a family type environment. And we actually got to selling product to a lot of the local people, like the restaurants, the bars, and things of that nature. And you actually became uh, kind of a, a, a huge family, actually. And I think that was kind of really, really, really important. And you began you could be you became personal friends with, with those type of people. Well, my name is Emer Hall and the business was the Marshall Candy Kitchen. Right across the street on six, I think six, ten or fourteen archer. It was a teenage wedding and the old folks wished them well. You could see that Pierre did truly love the mademoiselle. And I bought it from Ratty. I went in business October the 4th, 1944. I went in there in 49, I bought the building in, I think, 50. The building was kind of falling apart because of a blocked drain pipe. 
So I had to tear, tear it down and build it back up. That was 1951. Then I put the bar along there with the stools, you know. Used to be the first bar in there was just a stand-up marble bar. And when I got the sit-down bar, why? Jock Malloy was always one of my first customers in the morning. He always drank a chocolate malt with a raw egg in it. He did that for years. <laughs> but, and making candy. And I made all my syrups, chocolate syrups. And uh, we had uh, sandwiches, uh, toasted ham, toasted cheese, combination of ham and cheese, toasted peanut butter, and then we had individual servings of camel soup. We put them in a hot cup and heat the soup up. And then we had a rotisserie uh, hot dog machine. I made peanut brittle and then coconut brittle, and I made uh, chocolate peanut clusters and heavenly hash. That's a mixture of coconut and chocolate and uh, marshmallow and you make it in a roll and then slice it off like a pinwheel, you know. And peanut brittle was a biggie. Your customers always came in, you know, at different times you could count a count when they come in and get a Coke or a soda or a Sunday. And after the show was out, the picture, why we'd be busy. We ha I had a lot of uh, tourists stop in the uh, summertime, you know. They always stopped in and they said they'd bring the thermos in for water. And they'd always, even repeaters would come a year or two later and say, you got some of that water. And they'd bring the thermos in I'd fill it up with our water here. The dance and lift in the jukebox and play the pinball. And sit around and drink coke and talk, you know, visit, and uh, always seem to enjoy themselves. The candy kitchen was a, was a, was a popular place with me uh, when I was growing up. When I was in high school, the candy kitchen was the place. That's where all the kids hung out. It was the candy kitchen, you know, back in those days. And uh, kids that never witnessed that don't know what they missed. A lot of the kids that liked a little more action went to the candy kitchen. Well, there they could sneak a little booze into their coke and have a little fun in the hiding in the booze and a little, oh, let's say a rowdier crew. But they had uh, a lot of fun, a lot of fun. I really enjoyed working with the public and the kids back in those days. Mm -hmm. Of course, I was only 24 when I went in there, so mm -hmm. <laughs> I was pretty young. Remember, back particularly back in the 1920s, different uh, food establishments, uh, groceries, grocery stores, uh, meat markets, restaurants uh, that were located here in Marshall during that period of time. Well, coming back a little ways from where Lichtenberger's was located, was a restaurant operated by people by the name of Hornbrook. It was a Busy Bee Cafe. That's where Nancy's Gallery is at the present time. Then uh, you go across the street, Main Street, on the corner of Route 1 and uh, Main Street, was uh, uh, a man by the name of John Mullins uh, operated the Keystone Cafe. Another interesting thing about the Keystone, when Jack Reagan had it, his mother-in-law died and he wanted to close the restaurant for uh, the funeral. But he couldn't lock it up. There was no way to lock it up. See, it was open 24 hours, 24-7. And uh, he could lock the front door, keep people coming in, but he couldn't lock the back end of it. And uh, he had to hire a woman to stay there at the restaurant while they went to the funeral. Coming back to the west uh, was the Al Cafe operated by uh, uh, Tom Crump and Tom was quite a quite a, uh, a jokester and he had a, 
a whole showcase full of of uh, jokes that you could play on people like uh, exploding cigars and cigarettes and uh, then it, uh, he was always play, playing jokes on people. When I first started coming to the Marshall was when I was going to high school and occasionally I would come downtown and eat dinner. Uh, money was pretty scarce then, but you could get at the Little Al Cafe, which is where basically to that now, you could get a plate lunch for a quarter and a dinner was 35, and the difference was you got a, a piece of pie with the dinner. Uh, across 6th Street, and on the north side, was Dahl's Grocery, and it was operated by Louis Dahl. His father started the store here, his name was D.D. Dahl. And that store was in business for almost 100 years. And uh, Mr. Dahl, Louis Dahl, finally closed the store when the World War II came along because they had to deal with food stamps and, uh, uh, and he didn't want to do all the paperwork so he had made enough money he could retire. Uh, then uh, also on the west of the east side of the square was uh, Rademacher's uh, bottling plant where they manufactured soft drinks. Uh, Raddy made his own ice cream and that's where I got my ice cream candy kitchen. And he bottled double cola and different flavored pops. See, the candy kitchen was run by ready makers. They also had another place just across the alley there, what they call little ready makers. And on band concert night, it's there where Bill Mealing's been now. On band concert night, you'd go over there and get your ice cream, get double dip cone for nickel. Around to the north was uh, Spots Meat Market, and they done their own butchering. They had a place in the southeast part of town, down to where the disposal plant is now, and they done their own butchering down there. They bought the animals and butchered them and brought them up here, and they even delivered meat around town. They had a, a man that drove a no-top buggy, and he'd deliver meat around town. You'd call in and tell them what you want, and he'd deliver it to them. In the north edge of Marshall, up uh, at the, where they cross the railroad tracks, up the, uh, on the Clarksville Road, it was a cheese factory, Kraft Cheese Factory, and uh, the farmers brought their milk in there, and then they processed it into cheese. And I was working on the farm then, and I used to have to bring a, 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 all the milk in the early in the morning, and uh, and then I'd get the cans of whey to take back to feed to the hogs. Uh, but that's a little bit about the, the food industry in Marshall, as I remember. The Eat and L Confectionery. It was owned by Ed uh, Toomey and his sister Lorraine. They had bought the restaurant, I believe, in uh, 46. It's either 45 or 46. It was on 6th and uh, Locust, across the corner from the courthouse, be the, the southeast corner of the courthouse across the street. It being that it was a sandwich and ice cream store, we had 10 fish sandwiches, especially, and, uh, and ice cream cones, homemade ice cream, and sometimes he'd make especially homemade candy. And then he would do, at times, what the family ate there, he'd have special breakfast for special people to come in early, then they would share that with them if it's an extra on. On the same time in evening time, they happened to have a pot roast or ham and beans or something different that was on our menu. Some of the regulars would come in and see what they had <laughs> and see if they couldn't uh, share with that. Ed's wife, Catherine, worked there, and of course Lorraine worked there. Prior to that, Lorraine had worked at the uh, candy kitchen and Ed had worked at Rademacher's. He lost his job at Rademacher's when Rademacher downsizes or retired out and let his, I believe it was his son take over and his son didn't want Ed anymore because I think he was going to do that job himself or whatever. Ed lost his job and didn't know what he was going to do, although he was also a farmer. This was a part-time job. So they purchased the and We girls who worked there just did the waitressing work. 
dipped the ice cream and made the cones and the sodas and that, did the waitress. I wasn't old enough to be working, but Ed said, you're tall enough, you'll fit the bill. And at that time, you didn't have social security numbers, so he said he got a social security number. And uh, I started working. It was more of a family type because the elderly come in, the young come in, the dating crew, and uh, they, uh, it was a very respectable place. And their competition being rabbit makers, of course, where Ed had previously worked, and uh, Murphy's Ice Cream Store, which was down on uh, Main Street, about on the fifth corner there, fifth, I believe. And uh, it, but Murphy's was several little farmers and the families that had smaller children went in there, and uh, then some of the old farmers and wives that didn't have any children at all were not interested in the theater because they left the movie they would come to the NL was the closest one after the movie, and uh, so when they closed down they bought out the competition, they bought out Randy Makers and ran that and closed the EML. They had the uh, hamburgers, hot dogs, ham sandwiches, uh, some cold salad sandwiches, and uh, so basically it was only sandwiches, and then the ice cream. Best thing I ever got come in for is when he'd make the ice cream straight out of the freezer. And the ice cream maker was the soft ice cream, and uh, everybody knew when he was going to make a special butter burger was a special day, it seemed like, and they knew he was making ice cream on butter burger. And, there was lots of stories made of the soft ice cream before it got put in the pot to be the hard ice cream. And people wanted to make it in to find out when he's making it and what time it was going to come off. But he's homemade fudge and that he'd make at special times like Christmas and whenever, whenever he had spare time, sort of like he would make up a batch of uh, a fudge, which was real tasty. My mother and father owned the business, Henry and Reba Porman. And of course I was a son, it was a mom and pop grocery. Uh, back in those days they were referred to as mom and pop grocery because that's that's basically who ran the stores. It was mom and pop organizations. Uh, kids worked in part time and were family oriented. Mm -hmm. My first memories probably growing up uh, as a kid uh, in the store was the first store that they had. I was, uh, on Saturday night, they had a filling station and a store together. And the farmers used to come to town and. and uh, by a red man chewing tobacco, and at that time, baseball cards were on the back of red man chewing tobacco. And they didn't want the cards, they just took the tobacco, and they gave me the cards. So on Saturday night, I hung around the station and got all the baseball cards. And that's kind of my, one of my first memories. There was a lot of mom and pop stores in this town. It seemed like every corner had one. In our area where we were at, there were four grocery stores in two blocks on the same street. It's great to be back home. Home is where I want to be. But the main competition came later on uh, with the Kroger's and the big supermarkets and that's, that's where the competition came from that kind of had to do with the closing of your stores. And so I spent basically all of my life in the grocery or food business one way or another, either in wholesale or retail or manufacturing. Tom's Cafe, and it was, um, what well, is still there, it's the family restaurant now. My husband and I had it for 37 years then, but his father started it and had it for several years, and then he became ill, and my husband took it over, and we had it from then on. So my dad talked to Tom, who was a good friend, and told him, he said, I want you to buy that restaurant. And Tom says, well, he says, I couldn't. He says, I don't have the money. Well, he had a big family, and he's working a night shift down there at the restaurant all by himself. And he had a heck of a business. 
and he worked from seven at night till seven the next morning by himself. And he did all the cooking, waited the tables, washed the dishes, and uh, I don't think he was making very much. So my dad convinced him that he, he uh, could operate this restaurant. And uh, my dad was at that time was president of one of the local banks and they loaned him the money, and Tom paid that off in one year. And it's, he was a great success. I've seen people stand in line out on the sidewalk on Sunday for Sunday dinner, waiting, waiting to get into the restaurant. And then we, we bought two more buildings and tore them down and made added a dining room and a lounge. It was just one, the one building, the restaurant cart, and we added two more rooms then later. Everything was made on the premises. Everything, we had a butcher shop and a bakery and the baking equipment in a room uh, and uh, uh, the prep room back there. We did everything there. Baked the pies, the rolls, and uh, the yeast rolls, and the cinnamon rolls, and everything was made. Like, um, we'd have chicken and noodles, and, and my mother-in-law made the noodles, and uh, we had all kinds of salads. We had a varied menu every day, and it changed. Well, hamburgers, of course, we ground our own meat, and made the hamburgers, which, uh, and made, we made uh, tenderloins, breaded tenderloins, and grilled tenderloins, and, and that was cut. We had a big ice box where the meat hung from hooks, you know, that they, they would bring it in and hang it. And then my husband, and then later he trained butchers to cut the way we wanted it done, and it was all cut there. I think they liked everything we had. But it was Midwestern cooking. I, I suppose in later years, uh, the Colonial Kitchen came, was in Marshall, and I suppose that was a, but in early years, I don't remember any competition. A lot, well, local, many, many, many local people. And then, too, um, we had lots of customers, especially on Sundays, it seemed like, Saturday nights and Sundays, you know, weekends, from Terre Haute and lots from Casey and Robinson and Paris, from all, all the surrounding towns. We had lots of customers that came all the time. Of course, ours was a family business. The whole family worked in it. This was a franchise business that we opened in the 50s, a town for South 6th Street in Marshall, Illinois. And I, I saw one in Robinson under construction and it caught my eye, so I immediately went to Champaign and investigated and we bought a franchise. seasonal business. We were open about six months each summer and of course we had uh, new employees each year which was no problem at all because we had a wonderful group of people. Some families had uh, as many as three or four children or families that worked for us during a span of years and uh, and we still have people uh, living in Marshall over car hops for us. <laughs> Food was root beer and coney dogs, was our specialty. And like I said, we had a very limited menu. Uh, we, had never, we had a pedigree pup and a rice burger, which
which was nothing but loose hamburger, and a barbecue, which was our coney sauce. Put that in a round bun. Yeah, it was very popular. We, uh, of course, had all the cute car hops, and they, uh, the boys really enjoyed that. <laughs> Plus the food. <laughs> and actually, that completed our 50 years of food business in Marshall. We started in 47 in a produce stand down here on the, well, where the Huck's uh, convenience store is now. There was a black hotel. And from there to Harlem Market, Dolan says, and IGA. We enjoyed the business. We had it for 20 some years. And uh, it was just such a pleasure to work with all the people we had. Uh, Ealing's Grocery was owned by my, my father, Frank M. Mealing. And uh, it was located on. Uh, initially on the site uh, of the current uh, Delaney branch of Old National Bank uh, and then in later years was located uh, directly across uh, the street from the north side of the courthouse. Mealing and Honrick, and then later was just Mealing's Grocery, and in later years, Mealing's Grocery and Meat Market. And the business uh, was sold to my father in about 1942, I think. That was the day that farmers came to town to buy groceries, and lots of, of them came in the evening and maybe went to a movie, so they wouldn't settle up their accounts and get their groceries until uh, after the movie was over. And we had a pretty long day at that time. And uh, we sold the bulk coffee there for 15 cents a pound. And Rounder Fresh, uh, many canned foods were about 10 cents a can. Back at that time, we sold uh, one cigarette that I remember, a wing cigarette, for 10 cents a package. One of the things that I think many people liked was the fact that we delivered groceries and meats. But since people didn't have refrigeration, they'd often call not long before uh, a meal time and ask us to deliver products to them. So sometimes a small order I'd take on a bicycle and I still ride a bicycle some. <laughs> In our grocery store, too, we sold kerosene because most of the people cooked with uh, uh, either coal stove or wood stove or uh, a little what we call coal oil uh, stove. And so when people ordered groceries, or if they wanted a gallon of coal oil or kerosene, we delivered that, too. Those are some of the earliest memories I have. I cooked for the prisoners. For breakfast they had cereal, sometimes oatmeal, sometimes other cereal, and usually an egg and toast, or else bacon and toast. Or, and I always had coffee. That's the only meal I had coffee for was breakfast. I reckon they usually fed them more on Christmas, you know, you can cook more up home too, so. It was opened in 1942 by my aunt and uncle, Golden and Lucille McNulty, and they ran the business together until 1947 when my uncle passed away. And at that time, then my grandma stepped in and helped my aunt with a store. It was solely run by, by the family, by her family. So, uh, my mother helped in the grocery store from time to time, and my sister and brother 
When they were old enough, they were attending North Elementary School, and after school, they would go into the grocery store and help stock the shelves, the canned goods, the, whatever was easy for them to get on the shelves. I can remember at least 11 grocery stores in the city of Marshall at that time, and each one had their own clientele. Uh, competition, I, I don't even remember that being a factor. My aunt stayed open late on a Saturday night, and in fact she didn't really have any certain hours, she just stayed and when people quit coming then she would close. But a lot of the country people would come in on Saturday and they would call it, they would do their trading. And I think that goes back to the days when people brought their products in, their eggs, their garden produce, and traded for groceries. Those people were, were really kind of like family because, you know, they came in every week and you really got to know them well. In fact, we even went to some of their homes for meals. Um, at that time, the downtown area and the stores, it was really kind of a social place because that's where you saw everyone. There, were, there weren't the activities like we have today with, within the school system and even the community. Um, so this was really uh, the, the way to socialize was in the stores. Definitely, it was a, a, Marshall was a, very much alive at that time with just anything you could possibly want. It was right here, right downtown. When I, when I was a, uh, just out of high school, I worked for Kroger's, and you didn't work for much money. I'd work uh, uh, probably 60 to 80 hours a week for seven bucks, less than 10 cents an hour. Some of the other clerks made about $20 a week, and I got about $7 when I was working full time in the summer and got older. I got 75 cents an hour, and that was good pay <laughs> back then. I think it's 25 cents an hour, and give a discount on our food. But uh, the free enterprise system is, is gone, in my opinion. The day the small business man is gone. Uh, the big supers have just taken over and the wife won't stop them now. Fast food. That's the, that's the, you, you just don't find restaurants anymore. You just don't find the homemade anymore. There wasn't much thought given to what was healthy and what wasn't healthy. Everybody ate pretty hearty meals. But today you have a lot of health concerns and a lot of health foods and solids and such that we didn't used to have back then. Back in those days, it was just uh, pretty simple. We had some bakeries on Main Street and just little things that you remember that uh, those days are gone and you don't see them anymore. I think basically the food industry now, the grocery chain, is primarily uh, 24 hours, 7 days a week. What changed Marshall a lot was when the theater burned down, that people went out more through that, you know, and then they started going out and eating different places. And then your fast foods came in. It was very vital at that time. There was so much activity, of course. We had so many different kinds of stores. Um, well, of course, with Walmart that we have now, they sell a lot of the products that, that were the specialized stores that we had downtown. A very drastic change. Back in the early days, there was probably 20, 20 or better little grocery stores, some of them in one room of the, the owner's house. It's, it, there's such a drastic change that uh, I'm saying some good, some bad. 
it's a change that uh, I still am not happy with at our little town of Marshall. Nothing to do today, but smile.